Hey everyone, in today's video, I'm going to be going over five stocks that I've been buying throughout the month of September 2024. We're going to go through which five stocks these are, and then going to go into a bit more of an explanation as to why I'm buying them, why I'm bullish on these stocks, as well as what I'm going to be doing moving forward with these stocks and some more investor uh, relations information about each of these names as well, just to provide some background into uh, some of the reasons why I like these names. So if you like this kind of content, be sure to give this video a big thumbs up. Helps a ton with the channel. Just hit it right now and consider subscribing to the channel as well. Okay, the first stock that I've been buying this month is Uber Technologies. Uber is a stock that I've been buying into over the last handful of months. It's been a pretty rocky ride. I added pretty nicely on this dip here. So my average cost basis, even after dollar cost averaging up over September, is about $65, $66 a share. I'm at a kind of point here where if it continues to go up and up from here, I probably won't keep adding, but I kind of have a nice half position at least in it. But if it does fall to 70 or below 70, wouldn't mind getting that position a bit bigger as well this stock obviously up huge in the last year up 70 percent last five years up 150 percent but all of that pretty much has come in the last you know 12 18 months or so market cap on this name 160 billion dollars so getting to be a pretty big company here let's take a look at some more information on uber here you can kind of see their gross bookings quarter over quarter so you can kind of see they're doing what 33 billion dollars in gross bookings um, slowly over the last you know four five six quarters that's grown sequentially pretty nicely now we're at about 40 billion dollar run rate on a quarterly basis seeing strong double digit gains here um, both in constant currency and just in absolute terms so the company's growing really really nicely on top line on you know new users and how much those users spend but what's been growing a lot faster and what's anticipated to continue to grow a lot faster since the company is scaling up really nicely is the EBITDA and the cash flow so you can see here up 70 percent year over year on the EBITDA even though bookings are only up 20 percent continuing on here you can kind of just get a bit of a highlight on mobility and delivery so mobility which is just like when you hail an uber uh, through the uber app um, is just growing really nicely. Gross bookings, they're up 27%. EBITDA up huge. You can see here their margin on the revenues are about 76% in adjusted EBITDA. Lots of um, cash flow just flowing through to the bottom line. And you can see the growth of it's really nice. 1.1 billion, 1.3 billion, 1.4 billion, 1.5 billion, 1.6 billion essentially. So sequential, really strong growth. Uh, across the boards on all of their kind of KPIs there. Looking at delivery here, we see a bit more of a slowdown um, into the high teens, which is still really strong growth. What I really like about this business here is this company or this component of the business used to actually not be profitable, lots of promotions, lots of competitions, but they've been able to make it more and more profitable over the last number of years and quarters. You can even see adjusted EBITDA margins here going from two to three percent which don't seem like a big deal but on gross bookings of 18 billion dollars um, and on just revenues of, of billions and bill billions of dollars a couple percentage points can really move the needle in just how sustainable the business model is um, for delivery and these are the two biggest components of the business I'm buying the stock primarily because of the mobility segment. I think they have a lot of expansion opportunities, a lot of use case opportunities, um, and it's just one that they've been able to show. They've been able to um, achieve scale and, and grow EBITDA so much faster than just the revenues of the business and just the cash flows as well, really following the EBITDA, which we'll get into in a couple minutes. Um, here we are on free cash flow, so you can see Quarter over quarter, uh, we, we're getting to the point now we're going that we turned positive uh, a year or so ago. Then we turned really positive over a billion dollars a quarter. Now we're getting to the point that we're at 1.5 billion, 1.7 billion a quarter. And as that continues to ramp up with that 20% revenue growth and outpace EBITDA growth, we're going to start seeing multiple billions of dollars a quarter in free cash flow for this company, which is relatively capital light when you think about their business model. It's really just um, a platform that's connecting buyers 
um, or riders and, and, and drivers. So they've kind of talked a lot about what they're going to do with that free cash flow. Lots of it's going to start going into buybacks. And I think that's going to be another accelerator of earnings per share and cash flow per share in addition to just the organic fundamental business growth they have. One area of the business that's also growing really nicely, really fueling lots of this revenue growth, fueling lots of this user engagement is their Uber One uh, membership program. So you can kind of see some of their KPIs here. 3.4 times uh, the spend of um, for members versus non-members on a monthly basis. Just really driving that loyalty, making it so it doesn't make sense for someone to use uh, DoorDash for their delivery um, versus uh, Uber Eats. And when you're getting discounts on rides and, and stuff like that and cash back on rides, it really provides a great offering to someone who's using both rides and delivery and drives that loyalty so you don't have to win them with uh, coupons or promos on Eats. It just makes sense for them to be using Eats uh, because they're already bought in through, through the membership. And they have 19 million members here 300% increase just over three years. So obviously with the law of large numbers, I don't expect that rate to continue. But if they can hold this number, retain this number and slowly build on it, I think it'll be an accelerator of, of kind of the growth they've laid out on revenue and EBITDA for the company. Another big opportunity here, um, just broadly speaking, is bringing more forms of mobility onto the platform. We're gonna talk about electric vehicles in a second, but another thing they've been doing in lots of markets are bringing taxis onto the market. Instead of just going out and trying to hail a taxi, it's, it's a much easier way to, to even use um, yellow taxis in, in different markets. And lots of markets are very protective over their taxi industries. Um, lots of people are employed already. Lots of people buy or rent medallions, so they don't want to just plunge the value of those. So lots of markets are kind of a bit gun shy to let Uber in in a big way. But their technology and connecting um, riders with drivers is still applicable um, even in a world that it's taxis picking them up. And that's something they've really started to partner with and capitalize on. So you see here over 200,000 taxi drivers in 33 countries. This is like something I even experienced in a handful of countries I've been to. I went to Barcelona a year or two ago and I called an Uber, but they're all Uber taxis and a taxi comes to pick you up, but it's through the Uber app, right? So it's things like that. Um, that instead, instead of, uh, you know, traditional Ubers, as we think of it in North America, this has a lot more application that's just starting to get tapped that can connect, uh, riders with drivers or different forms of transportation, whether that's, um, buses with riders going longer distances, um, three wheelers with riders that just want to go shorter distances in certain parts of the world. It's so many areas that they can really, um, get into that just brings a lot more, demand and utility to transportation as a whole. Moving on here, this is just one slide on delivery that I wanted to slip in um, because it is an area that isn't as profitable, um, but you can kind of see over the last five years, they've been able to go from um, 600 million in the red to 1.5 billion in the green on EBITDA. So that's great to see. Lots of that came with just a lot of gross booking scale. So you can kind of see now um, on an annual basis over $60 billion, so about $15 billion a quarter, give or take. And in seven of the top 10, uh, seven markets out of their top 10, they are in the leading position. Okay, so they are pretty dominant, either the market leader or the number two position in lots of these markets, um, which is great to see that where they're focusing in, uh, they're winning. Last but not least, just Something that I want to build on here. There's been lots of volatility around Uber. If like robo taxi networks are going to eat their lunch, I still think um, Uber is the is the business that has all of the users and consumers going to for rides, and that comes with a lot of power in this space. Even if it does go over to autonomous vehicles um, in in the future, and I think the value prop that Uber brings is an autonomous network is not going to be profitable unless it has very high utility, unless you constantly have lots of uh, demand in downtown centers of people that will have those cars full of people um, throughout the night. Just think of like a hotel chain. If your occupancy level in a hotel is only 
40, 50, 60%. It's no way you're going to make money. You really have to be at 80%, 90% plus. Think of it the same thing as like an AV. Um, in an autonomous vehicle, if only 20 or 30% of the night your car is getting used, that's like a lot of miles that you're not monetized, a lot of miles that you're paying insurance for, or, you know, just depreciating the car that you're not getting any value for. So bringing people like Uber and partnering with Uber where that demand already exists really makes the equation make more sense to deploy um, AVs for the purpose of um, ride sharing or a robo taxi network. So I really do think that lots of these AVs will go and have partnerships with Ubers and even Lyft potentially um, versus building it themselves. I think they'll lose so much money out of the gate Maybe Tesla or one of those kinds of companies, if the market's in a position to swallow big losses for a few years, may try to build something up. But I think it won't be broad. Um, and honestly, I, I don't think it'll be overly successful or sustainable longer term for, for one car company to really do that. So I feel pretty good with Uber's position, even after AVs maybe become a bit more prominent. They have a lot of private investments in lots of um, AV companies. Um, they're on board of directors of lots of these companies. So they are definitely going to sway these companies towards these kind of partnerships and agreements already. Um, Tesla is, I guess, the one wild card that may be big enough and bold enough to try to do it themselves. Um, but it's not something that I'm overly worried about with the thesis of this stock. Going into the second stock that I have been buying more of this month. So it is a &W Royalty company royalty income fund here you can see here in the last month or so it has been trending up overall so i've been buying i bought two or three times in the low 34 so probably somewhere around here on the dips more or less under 34.50 it's kind of risen the last handful of days here to over 35 dollars but i was buying between a five and a half and six percent starting yield on this company lots going on with this company obviously it's an income fund right now but they've actually announced that they're planning on merging the company with their ANW Food Service Corporation, which actually owns the ANW business, not just the trademark. Um, they're going to hold the distribution yield, what it is, and they're going to do kind of like a buyout merger at $37 a share in October. So if that actually goes through, it seems like there'll be a liquidation opportunity in October at $37 a share. So you'd like to think, fingers crossed, that the stock would trend up closer to that. With that being said, I think I'm going to give the new company a shot. So I'm going to hold all my shares. Um, I do really like uh, lots of their growth prospects and kind of how they lay out the, the, the partnership um, and, and the new company here. So we're going to go through just some of the slides and kind of see um, that the, they now have over a thousand restaurants, about a thousand sixty restaurants across Canada. And I've actually owned a &W royalty fund for years. So I have a good sense of how they've been growing the restaurant count across Canada. It was, I remember owning the stock when it was under 900 stores and every year it would go up, you know, three, four, 5% pretty steadily. Then it was obviously 950, got close to a thousand. Now we're over a thousand. Now we're well over a thousand to 1060. I've also seen their mix of restaurant concepts change over time. Um, food courts have gone down probably um, about 50, 60 food courts. The pandemic definitely didn't help that side of the business. And then Urban Street Front pretty much came out of nowhere, and that's growing. Uh, drive through is another one that looks like it's slightly grown as well. So I like their overall mix of, of concepts. Obviously, um, Food Court is probably going to continue declining. Urban Street Front, which is like downtown cores, will probably continue going up, and it's going to be that dynamic over the next few years. But overall, I think they have a pretty good mix of restaurant concepts. They're pretty... Um, established specifically on the western side of Canada, some opportunities on the east, which we'll get to in a minute, but I'm pretty comfortable with their network. They're 99% franchised, so lots of just royalty and, and licensing income coming into the, the merged corp um, once this deal goes through. Over here, you can kind of see um, some in information just on uh, the dollars per restaurant that are um, coming in. So you can see the company's been doing really well at growing um, their sales per restaurant to over one and a half million dollars. That's huge compared to, you know, where we were um, in 2014, just about 1.25. Now we're at 1.75 or whatnot. 
So pretty nice, stable growth over the years. Obviously, the pandemic uh, was a bit of an off year there. Um, but overall, doing pretty well on that front. Moving on here, you can see um, from a burger chain uh, standpoint on growth, they've been growing really nicely over the last number of years. Overall, obviously, McDonald's is the king of this industry, even within Canada. So $7.1 billion in sales in Canada. a w is a strong second at about $1.85 billion. So lots of opportunities um, there, about 400, 500 restaurants less than McDonald's in Canada, give or take. And when we look at that, the 400, 500 restaurants, they actually have very similar coverage on the west side of Canada, where they have a lot less coverage as the east side. So you can see here, as they're looking for white space or where they're gonna open new franchisees, um, it'll probably be the east side of Canada, close that gap, grow their network by 30, 40% over the next, you know, five, 10 years probably. But that's gonna bring a lot more royalty income, a lot more system-wide sales, a lot more scale on marketing into the business. Um, and I just think they have a nice little growth plan here, even within Canada, that I think could benefit from being a part of with the stock. And you're getting a nice dividend yield too, still. So they explain some of the details of the transaction here. You can pause the video if you want to read more, or you can go and read more on this whole deck. They really break through it all. They also have a investor call that you can listen to that I've listened to before. You can kind of see here $37 in cash is on the table in exchange for each new unit. Um, and um, this was a huge premium, about a 30% premium versus what uh, the royalty fund was trading at. I think this was largely um, a, a move of opportunity as the royalty fund was trading at a huge multiple discount, um, probably trading at around 15 times, 14 times when it was in the 20s earlier this year. And you just compare that from to lots of the QSR companies like McDonald's and whatnot, trading at 25 times, you can almost double the value of the equity in the royalty fund if you combine it with the new corp um, and the, the food so service corp rather, um, and get a multiple in the 20s given the growth rate of, of the overall company, how fast they've been growing restaurant count. So I can kind of see how they thought this was undervalued and they can really put a very strong value proposition together um, and go get compared apples to apples versus these companies trading in the mid twenties and try to get a better multiple on their earnings here. So, you know, I, I like the company. I've held it for a long time. I like that they're keeping the dividend. So I'm going to hold tight, give it a shot. I did buy a bit more just because um, I'm not concerned, obviously, but I, I thought it's very likely or a possibility the stock can run up to 37 and above leading to the like formalization of, of this merger. And I'm like, I'm just going to come in before just in case it, it takes off a bit after the first couple quarters of the joint results and they really laying out their outlook. Um, so I just wanted to get in uh, ahead of that. And I thought it was still a reasonable valuation buying in for like a 5.6, 5.7% yield. It probably was when I was buying the shares. Going into the third stock from this month, this was actually, I say quote unquote new stock because I've bought and sold Airbnb, um, I think two or three separate times. Um, in uh, my life, both times made a good amount of money, 20, 30% returns. And it's always the same ballpark. I keep buying around 90 to hundred dollars generally. And then um, I've sold a couple times in the one thirties. I don't think I've ever sold really in the one forties or one fifties. I usually let go of it before then, but this time I bought a bit higher. It was at about 109, 110. Um, after their earnings, the stock really crashed. If we just do a bit of a six month here, it was right here. So yeah, probably 113, 115. Um, I bought more, a bit more when it went into the high teens, 117, 118. And then it really jumped here, went into the low 130s, high 120s where it sits today. So I really don't have a big position. I think I have 15 shares or so. So about 1800 US dollars, 2500 Canadian dollars in my portfolio of this. So I'm in a bit of a buy, not really sure like, do I just sell it, take my 10, 15% gain that I've gotten since I haven't really been able to build out a full position from it? Um, or do I just hold it? I feel like it doesn't really make sense to just hold because it's too small. So do I continue dollar cost averaging in, increasing it? At $130 a share, I think there's maybe less upside opportunity in the next year or so as there was 
when it was $110 a share. So this is when I'm still fighting. I'm not exactly sure what I'm going to do. Long term, I do still like the company. That's why I'm fighting just keeping it and, and you know, buying some more and, and swallowing the cost. But you can see here, you know, the market really didn't like the earnings report. We saw uh, revenue deceleration. We saw outlooks um, change in terms of what the estimates were. We also saw some uh, rhetoric around how people aren't booking as far in advance as they used to. So all of those things tank the stock. You can see here, 41% uh, free cash flow margin still, really strong profitable company. Revenues up double digits, 11%. Income up 20%, which was really nice. You can kind of see here some of their other KPIs as well, experience and nights, just total like events or units booked for lack of a better term, up 10% or so, 125 million gross bookings over 20 billion. Um, so overall top line on KPIs, company look like they're doing pretty well. You can see revenues here decelerating, um, but still pretty nice growth year over year. And then some things that they kind of talk about a lot and, when I look at Airbnb, I do think they have a lot of potential for additional kind of ancillary revenues and whatnot. Here they're talking about just some of the strategic priorities uh, that they've made, uh, like improvements on a couple of them here that they say, um, making hosting more mainstream, just increasing supply essentially, um, perfecting the, the core service a bit more, and then expanding beyond the core. They have a great opportunity to add in a lot more benefits or product offerings onto the platform, whether that's car rentals, whether that's insurance, um, whether that's other things people can do on their stays, advertising, whatever. They can have so many additional sources of revenue here in product categories that are just untapped right now. So I think there's lots of opportunity for them to grow a lot and become a lot more of a full service offering like Expedia or like a booking.com than, than they are today. In addition to just lots of runway of growth of getting more supply on, um, on, on their platform, on their site, um, entering new markets in a bigger way and getting some of those big markets that they're currently in to the saturation that they have in countries like the US, Canada, etc. Going into what they're doing with all this cash flow. They are reinvesting lots of it, but in addition to that, they've been doing a great job of starting to actually um, buy back net shares. So you can see here, 2022 had over 700 million shares. Now we're down to 673. You can kind of see it um, improving or, or ramping up in terms of how many net shares are being taken out each quarter. So I really like that they're returning capital to shareholders in a pretty meaningful way. And uh, Brian Chessy, the, the uh, Chessy, sorry, the, um, CEO and founder of Airbnb kind of talks about this pretty passionately as something that he looks like he's going to continue to prioritize in his capital allocation models. Um, they're just spitting off tons of cash flow, and this is a great way to return it to um, investors. So really like to see the trajectory that they're on on that front, at least. On to stock number four, it is Visa. So actually, I just bought Visa over the last few days when it crashed a bit on the news that the um, DOJ was going to be suing them over their debit card practices. Um, I won't talk too much about that. Uh, we'll get into it a bit, but overall, I just think Visa, MasterCard, this entire space, there are such great companies here. You can see the last five years here. What a great chart. And um, it's one that I've continued to nibble in over the years. Got all the way up to 290, um, 293 actually. It hit its 52 week high there. Um, so when it peeled back into the 270s, I said, you know what, this is a great chance to just pick up a couple more shares here. Um, and, and that's kind of what I did. Taking a look at a bit more um, information here. This is such a profitable company. Just the cash flows that they make and what they're able to reinvest is incredible. Um, over the year to date for the first three quarters, had over $13 billion of cash provided from operations. Um, out of that, over 12 billion of free cash flow. That means they spent, you know, six, seven percent on capex of their entire 13.3 billion. And then out of the 12 billion in cash flow, they pretty much gave it entirely back to shareholders. 11 billion of share buybacks, two, three billion dollars of dividends, and they continued to increase the dividend year over year at a pretty nice clip. Think 10 percent plus um, type of figures here. So you can kind of see just their overall performance here. 
10% revenue increases, 17% income uh, increase, so they're getting that scale as well, and then 20% EPS increase because they are buying back um, so many shares that their EPS is uh, outpacing their net income levels here. Going into just that DOJ thing, you know, <laughs> I, I'm not a, a legal expert. I, I read a bit about um, the, the case here. It, it seems like a, a bit of a reach, a bit of an overstep. They're offering volume discounts um, to, you know, big retailers and retailers that bring them lots of volume. That's no different than things that lots of companies do to drive scale and to, to win big accounts and win exclusivity agreements and stuff like that. So, you know, it's the big bag credit card companies. Uh, so I, I get that there's going to be continuous regulatory pressure. I think they just have such a strong moat, such a strong business model. They are in a bit of a oligopoly, let's call it, with like Amex to a lesser extent, more notably MasterCard. But they do really compete with each other. Um, and I just don't think... Uh, the merits of this particular argument make a ton of sense because I can probably showcase similar agreements that take place on most of the stocks that I own, um, whether that be companies like Coca-Cola probably giving volume discounts to um, Walmart. They're not getting sued because mom and pop shops on the corner aren't getting the same absolute pricing. I, I just don't see the difference really. Um, in, a, in a major way. And there's lots of even more predatory exclusivity agreements that are deemed to be legal. So it'll be interesting to see how this plays out. It seems like Visa will be fighting it pretty aggressively and it'll be interesting to see the net impact. Um, but yeah, I just thought any dip in Visa dipped about 5% on this news. Any dip in Visa, uh, such a great business, such a great moat, such global exposure, essentially a toll on the global economy and lots of other tailwinds with cash to card conversion still in so many places of the world. I just thought it was a good opportunity to jump in a bit more. And then I just want to show a bit of a visual on their buyback. So they had about 2.2 billion um, coming into 2020. We're in 2024 now and we're uh, around 2 billion or just under. So they bought about 10% plus of the company back in the last four years or so, let's call it. Um, so you're getting a couple percent return a year just on owning more of the company if they keep up that pace. Okay, and the fifth and final stock that I am buying, or I have bought already throughout the month, and this one I actually started buying in a pretty uh, aggressive way, really wanted to bolster the position. Unfortunately, it continued to go up, so I got some here in the 280s, bought again in the low 290s. Now we're almost at $3, so this has been one hell of a month um, for Diversified Royalty Corp. Stock pays about an 8.5% dividend yield. Um, you can see here over the last number of years, um, it's held up pretty well, obviously went through a bit of a rough time during uh, 2020 or so, but it's bounced back really nicely. They've continued to increase the dividend too. And unlike a and royalty or some of these other royalty companies that only play in one sector of the economy, Diversified Royalty Corp plays all over. So you see here some of the trademarks that they own or have agreements with, Sudden Realty Group. Mr. Lube is their biggest one, Air Miles, Mr. Mike's Steakhouse, um, Bar Burrito's a new one, Stratus is also a new one, and Oxford there. So just to talk about some of these, some of these are pretty obvious or, or you, you probably have heard of them or seen them. Um, Oxford is, is like an after school or a special one-to-one um, -one kind of learning center um, for um, for people to enroll their kids in. Sudden is a real, like a brokerage essentially. It's a low cost brokerage. Real real estate agents pay like 70 bucks a month. And then that is part of what gets paid out to you every month in your dividend. Mr. Lube is um, like a tire and oil change company. They also do other kinds of car maintenance. Lots of these you probably know of. A couple that you may not. Uh, Stratus is a commercial cleaning company that operates primarily in the US. They have an agreement with them that goes up every single year in terms of how much they get paid um, for renting back the use of the trademark and the license and the business um, to them. So that was kind of like a, a, a trademark sale lease back, if you will. And then Bar Burrito is a quick service restaurant. I know they're in Ontario. I'm not sure where else they are. Um, in Canada, uh, but they offer like 
Mexican fast food type services. Um, think like a cheaper version of Chipotle probably. Anyway, looking into the royalties they get from each of these businesses, kind of get a good sense here on the size of each of these components. Mr. Lube is the big dog here, almost 50% of the company. And then everything else here is just one, two million bucks a quarter. So you have Stratus, Barbarito, and everything else here. So all that's the diversificated part of it. Mr. Lube is really half the business. So you really have to be comfortable with owning that, that part of the business. It's actually done phenomenal over the last three, four years, growing at a really nice double digit clip. Um, but obviously um, that can always change. So it's good to have all these other um, businesses within, you know, more commercial side. Uh, also lots of quick service restaurants, also some nursing there or, or healthcare, if you will, um, real estate, uh, other restaurants, Air Miles, the one that's been a bit of a mess uh, out of all the ones that they've owned. But overall, uh, the company's done really well. They've been trying to position their dividend for a slight growth, even though they're paying eight and a half percent. So you can see here, um, once they got back to normal, about 18 cents a share, then they went up to 20 cents a share. Then I think they went to 20.4 cents um, or 2.04 uh, cents rather. This is on a monthly basis per share. And then they recently increased it to 2.1 cents a share. So getting some slight growth on a yield of over 8% is definitely not a terrible place to be. Um, so the stock's done uh, pretty well in my opinion over the last uh, couple years. In the last year, if I was to go back here, um, last year they, they're up 15% and that's not including the 8% dividend they've paid. So they've done, they've done pretty well. Those are the five stocks that I have been buying throughout the month of September. Soon I think I'm going to post a video of some of the stocks I'm looking at buying in October. So stay tuned or give this video a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel to make sure you get that video. If you like this kind of content, be sure to subscribe to the channel. And let me know in the comments if you have any thoughts on any of these videos. Thanks so much for watching to the end. Really appreciate it. Bye.